This past year, I have experienced a lot of death and the deep, empty holes death leaves and the ones that are left behind. Death of people who we might say they died too soon. A BSF leader who had just retired from work. My friend's husband in his early 50s, another friend's 25-year-old son, and another friend's eight-week-old baby girl. For my friends, they are crying out for longing, for understanding, for emptiness. They're grieving for the life their loved one missed. They're praying for hope in the anguish. And yet, this is the same response to Jesus' death. Jesus' family and friends grieved. Those who loved Jesus wept in anguish for understanding. But then something happened. Something unlike any grieving friend, mother, father had ever or will ever experience. Jesus rose again. Jesus resurrected from the dead and Jesus appeared to people. Jesus had a new glorified body, but a body that could still eat and drink and fellowship with other believers. The resurrection of Jesus Christ changes everything for you and me. His resurrection is a fulfilled promise and prophecy, see, promise and prophecy of God. And this gives you and me this incredible hope, hope knowing death is not the end. The promise is this, all believers will be resurrected into bodies perfectly suited for unhindered fellowship with God forever. Perhaps it's like this, the radiance of God's glory is just too much for these bodies to handle. So maybe they'll be like heavenly spacesuits so we can withstand heaven's weighty atmosphere of perfect penetrating love. God needs to give us glorified bodies so we can snuggle into the glorious holy presence of our Father God forever. When you and I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of you and me, the promise of God writes a new beginning for those who are suffering in grief and suffering in physical pain. Death for believers is the beautiful moment believers are physically prepared for paradise, physically prepared for paradise. So death isn't the end. Death plus new life is the story of the Bible, the gospel message. If we don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and therefore the resurrection of believers, death of our loved ones is going to seem so final and hollow. But Christ's resurrection declares the best is yet to come. Do you think the truth of Christ's resurrection and believer's resurrection is important enough to defend as a part of your testimony? The resurrection proves God's power to change lives. Jesus met and fought and defeated death and everything is different because Jesus overcame death. Jesus is alive. Christ's resurrection means your resurrection. It means your loved one's resurrection if they have cast their life on Jesus as their savior. Will this give you courage and hope when grief and sorrow and unspeakable heartache comes? And who do you need to tell that sickness and death is not the end of the story? When the resurrected King returns, all believers in Jesus Christ, those who are dead and those who are alive, will be reunited with Christ in paradise. No more mourning or pain or sorrow or death. Standing before Felix and Festus and King Agrippa, Paul says, the one thing you need to know about Jesus Christ is that he is God and that he has risen. He has overcome death. Everything is different because Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, lives. Will you please open your Bible to Acts chapter 24 and please pray with me as we explore the glorious implication of Christ's resurrection. Mighty God, we love knowing your resurrection is true. We love knowing that it means a new hope for all of us who are living on this planet with grief knocking at our door. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you have done in us to redeem and resurrect us. And in your name, Lord Jesus Christ, amen. So we find Paul in Caesarea. The high priest Ananias has brought charges against Paul before Governor Felix. They accuse Paul of being a troublemaker, of stirring up riots, of being a ringleader of this Nazarene sect. 
and desecrating the temple. And Governor Felix looks to Paul and he asks Paul to defend himself. Paul says, yes, I was in Jerusalem, but I did not stir up crowds. I was not arguing at the temple. They cannot prove any of these false charges. However, Paul says, I admit that I worship God. I admit I follow the way of God. And, and Paul affirms he is a true Jew because he embraced the message of the law and the prophets, the Old Testament to us. Christ followers do not stand in opposition to Hebrew scriptures. Christ fulfilled Hebrew scriptures. In reality, Israel's spiritual leaders at this time, they are standing in opposition to the scriptures because they don't embrace the Messiah, God raised up. Paul argues the one crime, the real charge against him, is Paul believes in the resurrection of a once dead man and the hope this truth brings. Again, I ask, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ part of your testimony. His new life is what gives you new life forever. Paul explains the reason he was in Jerusalem was to bring Gentile financial gifts to the impoverished Jewish Christ followers. Paul again brings up the root of the charge against him. The Jews are offended because Paul preaches the resurrection of Jesus as God's promised king God's high priest and prophet announced by the Hebrew scripture prophets. The living Jesus is the long awaited Jewish Messiah. So this was not a criminal charge in a Roman court. So Paul was under guard, but he was free to be with his friends. Several days later, Felix and his wife Drusilla sent for Paul. And Paul's always ready to give an answer to proclaim the hope that he has to share the gospel of Christ. And so he seizes this opportunity to help these leaders of the country to understand salvation. But when Paul began to speak on righteousness and self-control and divine judgment, Felix, who is a very morally chaotic person, he doesn't want to hear it. And we all have these people in our lives, don't we? Those who love to hear about Jesus' love and kindness and love to receive blessings, but they defiantly shut their ears about the holy, sanctifying work of God, God who commanded righteousness and God who authors judgment. You can't just believe parts about who God has revealed himself. The Bible is complete. After a two-year incarceration, Jesus is moving people and situations to fulfill Jesus' promise to Paul, that Paul would speak before kings about Jesus Christ. In chapter 25, the chief priests pounce on the new leadership. On Festus's third day on the job, the chief priests come again with their agenda. Remember, they fasted day and night to get Paul, to, until Paul dies. But they come again, and these charges cannot be proved. So Paul appeals to the king, King Agrippa, and his wife. They are coming to pay their respects to Festus, and Festus tells them of this inherited problem of Paul. It's always interesting, isn't it, what people will remember about the story you tell them. Will they remember the key parts? Will they remember what is most important, or will they highlight what has been a side part of the story? And praise God, what stands out to Festus is exactly what preacher Paul wants him to remember. The Jews and Paul had one main difference in their belief. There was a dead man named Jesus who Paul claims is alive. God the Son lives and this is the deal breaker. The resurrected Jesus changes everything. Believing the resurrected Jesus changes everything. The next day in the public amphitheater before high-ranking officers, the and prominent men, Agrippa gives Paul permission to speak. And this is Paul's longest recorded sermon in the book of Acts. And no doubt, Paul has been praying for this moment ever since Jesus told him in the sweetness of the night that if this was coming. Initially, Paul explains his attachment to Judaism and the hope of the nation for, for their Messiah, Israel's long-awaited deliverer. He relates to them, and may I suggest when you are sharing the gospel, look for areas of agreement. Sometimes building bridges of agreement paves the reception for differences. 
Next, Paul claims the Messiah had come in the person of Jesus Christ, whom the Jewish leadership rejected and they killed. But God vindicated Jesus' divine nature through the resurrection from the dead. And this is the hope that he, Paul holds out to every one of you in, in this, everyone in the sanctuary, in the amphitheater. And he says in verse eight, it, could it be incredible that God raises people from the dead? Paul explains he hated Christians until one day the risen, resurrected, living Jesus appeared to Paul on his way to Damascus. Paul's savior called Paul by name. Paul's savior gave Paul a mission. Paul's savior rescued him and he loves to tell the story of Jesus's rescue. All three times as Paul relates his Damascus experience in the book of Acts, he shares the gospel of Jesus Christ. The story is not about Paul. The story is about Jesus Christ. And Paul lets everyone in the amphitheater know the risen, resurrected Jesus turns people from darkness to light. From darkness to light, Jesus turns people from the power of Satan to the power of God. Jesus forgives sins. And he gives people a place among those who are sanctified by faith in God. Paul says, I'm saying what the prophets and what Moses said. The same book the Jews read. It explains the Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead and bring the message of light to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Jesus would not only become the suffering servant, he would also become the resurrected king and deliver the light of the world from Festus's pagan background, the resurrection of a dead person was just too much. And so out of his frustration and probably embarrassment, he interrupts Paul. Paul goes right back, though, to addressing the highest authority in the room, King Agrippa. He says, you know the Hebrew scriptures that predict the true king. Do you believe in Jesus? And Agrippa, he responds, do you think you can persuade me to be a Christian? It's a pretty telling response, right? It indicates Agrippa's awareness of the movement of believers and the way of Jesus Christ in the country. It's encouraging to know that our defiance of God is not an obstacle for God's grace. Our defiance of God is not an obstacle for God's grace. No one is beyond the grasp of God. No one is beyond the grace of God. God does the entire work of salvation. All we do is cast our lives on Jesus, our resurrected living Messiah. In verse 29, Paul prays, everyone in the amphitheater believes. The way you know you are praying from your heart and not just reciting empty religious words is you're actually willing to be a part of the answer? Are you willing to be a part of the answer to the prayers you are praying today? Paul is always prepared to testify of his hope in Jesus Christ. Do we allow God-ordained witness opportunities to slip away? Or are we clear about who God is? We are safe in the will of God and God will never fail in a single promise to us. His resurrection changes everything. So here's what I pray you believe. All believers will be resurrected in bodies perfectly suited for unhindered fellowship with God forever. All believers will be resurrected in bodies perfectly suited for unhindered fellowship with God forever. Will you please pray with me? God, we long to never lose the wonder that you are a risen, reigning king, that, that you allowed us to go through death in order to be risen out of it into new life. The entire story of the Bible, the entire purpose of God is to allow these creatures on this planet to, to be in a forever fellowship with him. So we thank you that you have done that for us, that you have risen us into a new life, and that you will give us these beautiful resurrected bodies to enjoy your presence, unhindered fellowship forever. It's in your great name we pray, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.